Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming along to this talk. My name is Rob. I work as the Data and GIS Officer at Amphibian and Reptile Conservation within the Species Programs team. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit how we're using some of the ArcGIS tools to help support our wildlife monitoring program, the National Amphibian and Reptile Monitoring Program. Um, I'm going to cover a bit of background about some of the issues, talk about some of the challenges we're trying to solve using technology, and then some of the solutions we've put in place. Now, for those of you that are unfamiliar with amphibian and reptile conservation, or ARC as we're commonly referred to, we're the leading national wildlife charity focused on the conservation of our native amphibians, reptiles, and their habitats. And as well as working within those areas, we also work to try and infuse and engage people in the conservation of these species and habitats too. Now, currently, glob global biodiversity loss is a huge issue, and amphibians and reptiles are also affected. Some studies carried out in 2009 by Cox and Temple using something called the IUCN Red List Assessment Process, whereby species are assessed based on their threat risk of extinction, found that around a fifth of European amphibians and reptiles were at risk. We carried out a similar um, assessment back in 2021, just focusing on our British native amphibians and reptiles, and approximately a third were in threatened categories. So certainly issues and concern over the status of our species. We actually have 13 native amphibian and reptile species here in the UK. We have seven amphibians and six reptiles, as you can see here. Apologies to anyone who, who is not too fond of any of these species, but um, I'm here to advocate for them. And some of these are particularly at risk. So for example, the northern pool frog actually went extinct in Britain. It's since been reintroduced by ARC and partners to two sites. Natajack toad is only found at around 60 sites throughout the country. And the smooth snake is restricted to heathlands in southern England within Britain. So in order to understand and monitor these species, we've developed the National Amphibian and Reptile Monitoring Programme. And what that is, is a portfolio of different surveys and projects designed to understand, generate and analyse data on those species. So the aim is for us to be able to then conduct species status assessments inform things like policy, land management, um, and reintroduction programs. Currently within our strategy at ARC, there are two particular areas that are relevant to the program. So firstly, in order for us to increase knowledge and understanding, so going out there, generating and analyzing data so that we can do those things, do species status assessments, for example, but also to widen our engagement, reach out to different communities, uh, engage with them, and encourage and enthuse them to get involved with the conservation of our native species and ideally also to participate in the monitoring of those species. So focusing on that kind of need to increase our knowledge and understanding, there's a few kinds of data we're really interested in, in gathering. For example, the location of the species, so their presence, how many there might be, abundance, the proportion of sites they might occupy, or occupancy as we might call it, population trends, and then the habitat conditions and associations with those species. Now, collecting these kinds of data is incredibly intensive, takes a lot of manpower, a lot of time in the field, and so we need a set of resources and tools and also the community to help us gather those data. So when we were looking to develop this program, we looked at the kind of technology we might need to support it in our management and delivery of it. So that comes into kind of widening our engagement so a few things that we needed. Firstly, some sort of web presence to present information to the public, resources to our volunteers and surveyors and our partners. Some sort of way of operating and working with groups and communicating with them effectively. Ideally, some form of geospatial field data collection tools, preferably something that works offline. Better routes for sharing data to different user groups and in a secure manner. And ways to interpret those data and analyze the outcomes. Now, it's worth noting that the national program is actually made up of multiple different surveys and projects, um, some focused on single species, some national, some regional, but they all contribute different pieces of the puzzle to our overall understanding of these species. Within that, we're also allowing for different opportunities for people with different levels of ability, experience, skill, time availability, interest, and geographic location. But in doing so, by having multiple projects, we obviously have a, a larger burden on ourselves to make sure we're engaging with those different user groups and providing them resources, perhaps in slightly different ways. 
Moving on into some of the, the tools we're actually using to help support the program. So in terms of our web area, we've built a series of ArcGIS Hub-based sites and initiatives, an area we call the Arc Survey Hub. That's where we present all of our resources, all of the information to our surveyors. We're using groups and supporting teams within ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Hub Premium to share resources to those groups alongside community user accounts whereby our volunteers can have their own ArcGIS Online accounts um, through our ArcGIS Hub Premium subscription to allow them access to restricted resources that we otherwise couldn't share publicly. In terms of field data collection, we are using Survey123 and field maps. And then a whole host of different tools and resources to facilitate better data sharing. So, for example, we're making use of hosted views and authoritative feature layers in ArcGIS Online to make sure that we're then filtering just the, the appropriate information down to different user groups. <coughs> Our volunteer surveyors can act access their own survey submissions through their Survey123 inbox or via uh, an experience they have access to through our Arc Survey Hub, whereby they can view, uh, interact with, and download their own submissions. We have other dashboards, web apps, and also we're finding that Story Maps is quite a useful tool for providing information, such as our survey protocols, user guides for the apps, to those users in a kind of easily digestible format. And finally, in terms of reporting, again, a variety of tools particularly, again, using things like dashboards, um, story maps for communicating the outputs, um, and also conduct both internally sorry, and externally. And then for further analysis and interpretation, we're using ArcGIS Pro. I now want to take you through a bit of a, a tour of what this actually looks like to our users. So this is one of our ArcGIS Hub Premium sites. This is our landing page for the national program. And it just has some general information about what the program is, how to get involved, and it gives you uh, an overview of the projects within that program. So for example, if we have a look at the National Reptile Survey, this project has its own hub page within which users or members of the public can find out more information before, before they actually get involved. They can then follow through to our registration form, sign up, and then be issued with a community user account so that they can actually sign in and access those restricted areas. So once we're signed in, they can then access the, what we call the surveyors page, an area with all of our resources to support our community of surveyors. So if we click on that link now and go through to that page. And here we actually host those additional resources. So things like health and safety, loan, work, loan working guidance, forms they can take out into the field. Um, we have maps customised to their kind of local region and that interactive experience I was talking about to view and download their own data. Now, in this case, I'm logged in with a training account, so there are no data, unfortunately. Um, but if we actually take a look at the, the web app, this web app is showing what would be presented to a user in real life. This is actually a set of fictitious <coughs> sites. They would see the local sites for their project within their region. They can then zoom into the relevant sites, either in the web browser here or actually in mobile uh, field maps as well. See all the spatial content that's been mapped. They can do that themselves, or we can do that for them, things like their survey routes, perhaps the location of a pond for an amphibian survey. And then nearly all of our maps, we have customizations in the pop-ups using HTML to allow um, them to load Survey123 forms directly and populate those forms with the relevant information. And that really helps us to cut down on some of the data errors, things like incorrect site names and locations. So this is just an example of one of our survey forms. Most of our forms have been developed in Connect, um, for use in the field app. However, we do also have a handful of uh, public-facing web forms as well. And in this example, the surveyor can launch directly from field maps or through the web browser if they're back on their computer. They can then fill in the form, submit their wildlife sightings, and our database is then obviously automatically updated in near real time. In terms of how different user groups engage with our Arc Survey Hub and our resources, Firstly, members of the public obviously have access to our public content, our public pages. They can learn about the program. But in some instances, they're also able to submit features such as wildlife sightings to our projects. So as an example, we have a project called Garden Dragon Watch, which encourages members of the public to go out and record amphibians and reptiles in their gardens. They can then submit those sightings through a public web form 
and then they can see the results in the public dashboard and interact with that to see the progress of the project. Moving on from that, we have our community of volunteers, users with um, community user accounts or logins. Depending on the projects they are involved with, they are then able to submit features relevant to those projects. So as an example, someone participating in our national amphibian survey will be able to record their survey site, the ponds they're planning to survey, and of course, their wildlife sightings as a result of those surveys. They can then access that user area, very similar to the one we just saw for the National Reptile Survey, view and download their own submissions, and also in some cases view data submitted from others where it's not sensitive. We have another aspect to our community, which is our partners and our stakeholders. So very commonly that will be our landowners, our land managers, other data organisations. And where possible, we provide them with access to a partner area. And in that area, they're able to submit features that might be relevant to them. So as an example there, we might have a landowner who is actually conducting a survey themselves. They might map their site and carry out the survey and submit their own wildlife sightings. Or alternatively, they might map an area they have available to survey, and we then make that available to our pool of volunteers as an option for survey. The key thing, though, is that we're making available the data that we're generating within their land holdings so that they can download and use that in their land management for the purposes of conservation. In terms of staff use, we actually have around 50 staff in the organisation. Currently, around 30 um, have access to ArcGIS. And many of our staff are actually operating as field data collectors. So we actually own or manage around 80 nature reserves. So many of our staff are out in the field using Survey123 and other tools to help manage our reserves, but also to record wildlife within those reserves. We have other project staff who are running particular survey projects, but staff also acting as verifiers of those data, maintaining the quality of those data. Then finally, we have a smaller pool of data, uh, sorry, a smaller pool of staff who oversee the management of the data of the content and the hub initiatives. I mentioned briefly earlier that we're using hosted views in ArcGIS Online, and that is really key to how we flow and control data when we're dealing with so many different user groups. So within ArcGIS Online, we, we host a handful of authoritative feature layers. For example, a layer containing our wildlife sightings, one containing our sites for surveys, site features. And that is populated primarily through data submitted through Survey123 and field maps. Those hosted layers are then managed by relevant staff, and then they create subsequent views to share to the relevant user groups. So as a couple of examples, we have uh, views accessible by staff, perhaps without edit permissions, allowing them to review and verify data. But most of our views are going out to our community of users. So for example, similar to the map I showed earlier with that regional view of sites, we're sharing regional views of information just so people can see what's happening in their local area. And this is kind of a fundamental principle that we've tried to stick to in terms of how we present information to our community in that we're trying to present information in a simple manner without any unnecessary clutter. So only showing what's necessary to that user and hopefully in a way that people can engage with because we can't provide direct one-to-one -one training with every single user. Um, it needs to be fairly intuitive. As we near the end, I want to just highlight a few other areas of kind of configuration we've put into place to make the system work for us. So we are using organization branding across all of our apps and our web page and so on. Alongside that, also custom domains in ArcGIS Hub to maintain that kind of sense of, of brand, sense of our organization. Also using dynamic gallery cards and site page row and item view sharing and access controls within our ArcGIS Hub pages. That allows us to build sites that contain much more information when users log in, they only see what is relevant and pertinent to their particular role. Additionally, we have custom sign-up terms and conditions, which allows us to kind of manage the, um, our users and ensure they're sticking to uh, a consistent use of the system. We have various scheduled Python scripts, which are helping to maintain the data. One particular <laughs> example would be we're using those to maintain our external CSVs that support our Survey123 forms to ensure they're up to date. We then also have supporting teams and groups alongside hosted views, as we've seen, again, helping us to manage the data flow to particular groups of users. Additionally, custom HTML 
in our pop-ups to allow us to launch and populate forms, reducing data errors. And Story Maps is quite a useful tool to produce and deliver digestible information, such as our survey protocols. As I come to near to the end then, I just want to really highlight um, how the data we're generating within the National Amphibian and Reptile Monitoring Programme, and by collaborating with other partners, is helping us to assess the conservation of these species, the kind of outputs we're generating. So as an example, here we have a 10 kilometre distribution map for a species, and that is reliant on us having a very good, uh, thorough data set on the species distribution. We can then use those data to identify perhaps biases in the data, gaps in recording, which is a common issue in biological recording, so where maybe we need to target future survey effort, future regional projects, future training. Another example here is from a species distribution modelling analysis. So this is actually for our smooth snake project, um, snakes in the heather. So we used environmental data, land cover data, combined with high quality species monitoring data to allow us to identify areas of high habitat suitability for this species. So for example, in here, in this image, you'll see these darker areas are higher suitability for the smooth snake in Dorset. And that allows us to Again, target further monitoring, perhaps areas of high suitability that we don't actually have species observations for, or target land management to improve the suitability for those species in those areas. <coughs> Finally then, coming to the IUCN Red List analysis I talked about earlier that we carried out two years ago, that process was to assess the, the threat status of different species at different spatial scales within Britain. And what you see here, basically, is anything in red is a species assessed as critically endangered, orange, endangered, and yellow vulnerable. So anything in those three colours are the kind of real high-risk species. So you can see the breakdown on how we've done that um, based on different uh, national scales. So that is really important for doing things like informing policy. And to, to, to do those kinds of analysis, we're completely dependent on having good understandings of distribution, of range, and preferably population trends as well. Lastly then, just to um, say that our initial foray into and development of these systems was, as part, was part of our National Lottery Heritage Funded Project Snakes and Heather, so we're extremely grateful to the Heritage Fund for their support and say a huge, huge thank you to all of our surveyors, community scientists, citizen scientists, partner organisations and funders for their support along the way. Thank you very much for listening.